Hello, and welcome to this Beyond Clean virtual conference. The speakers for today's conference, the sponsors for today's conference, and the Beyond Clean team are all so excited that you're here. If this is your first time joining us for a Beyond Clean virtual event, I want to call your attention to a couple of event functions. All of the windows on your event screen are movable. You can shrink them, you can enlarge them, you can move them, whatever you need to do to create the event feel that works best for you. In the upper right corner is a resources tool. Download conference sponsor information and the resources and links that your speakers have provided for you. On the bottom left, you will see a Q&A or question and answer tool. Any questions that you have for the speaker during each session can be submitted to them using this feature. Our speakers today will bring you a wealth of knowledge and all of their information can be found in the speaker bio tool on the right side of your screen. Along the bottom are the icons for each of the windows as well. Clicking these will minimize and maximize each window. This will be an action-packed conference and there will be 15 minute breaks between each of the sessions. So feel free to grab a snack, check on the dogs or the kids, assemble a tray, do some jumping jacks, whatever you need to do before joining us again. All right, welcome everyone. Good morning, happy Friday. My name is Lindsay Brown from Beyond Clean and on behalf of everyone on the Beyond Clean team, I would like to welcome you to another dynamic Beyond Clean virtual event. Thank you for choosing to join us today for this one of a kind global educational event dedicated to improving data efficiency in your sterile processing department. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome back those of you joining us for yet, a, yet another virtual event and extend a warm welcome to those joining us for the first time. The video that I just went through explains some of the event features. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to submit a Q&A or access the info icon in the bottom of your screen. Joining me this morning for the world's largest instrument tracking virtual event is my colleague and friend, Brett Norton. Brett, welcome. Thanks, Lens, and good to be here with you. It's been a while since we hosted a conference together, so it's great it to be back. <laughs> uh, the title of today's conference is Total Tracking from pa the Patient and Back Again. We have an all-star lineup of industry leaders, clinical educators, and healthcare professionals who are joining us for a day of insightful presentations and candid conversations that are sure to inspire. Get ready to explore topics from high-level disinfection data tracking to increasing efficiency and staff retention in your SPD with the help of electronic tracking systems. I would like to extend a huge thank you to our event sponsor, Census Technologies, for helping to make this exciting day of virtual learning possible. I would also like to thank CCI for their collaboration for today's event. Yeah, and Brett, what an exciting day it is. We have over 1,200 registered attendees this morning, and I am so excited that everyone is tuning wow. in to learn about instrument tracking efficiency. This is going to be an awesome day. For those of you anxiously awaiting your CE credits, uh, I know that's a big deal, and after viewing all of today's live sessions, you will automatically be transferred to a full conference survey. Now, that survey is really important because it get, it allows you to provide feedback on today's event. How can we improve? How can we uh, keep making these educational events meaningful for you? Uh, after you complete that survey, you'll be able to download your six CE certificate, but that's not all because I wanna make a quick note that on the right-hand side of your screen, during each of today's sessions, you'll see all of the bonus content. There are four additional CEs available to you through bonus con content uh, found in the resources window. This content is available to watch and listen to either today or on demand at any time that's convenient for you. Like I said, in the beginning, we are excited you've chosen to spend your Friday with us for this educational event dedicated to surgical instrument tracking. I understand that you likely have a lot going on today between work or home, and I just wanna say thank you for being here for being dedicated to education and for doing something that will help you grow as a sterile processing professional. So we invite you to sit back, 
relax, uh, start the sterilizer load. It's time to get this event started. Kicking off today's conference is no stranger to Beyond Clean, Tracy Raymond. Tracy is a sterile processing manager at Dooley Healthcare. She's been in the field for over 25 years, starting as a frontline technician, and she's passionate about sterile processing sterile processing education and connecting frontline techs to the tools and resources that you need to complete your daily activities. As frontline techs, we all know the importance of thoroughly following reprocessing best practices. But did you know that scanning and tracking instrumentation throughout the entire reprocessing cycle is the most commonly forgotten step by technicians? Well, Tracy is here to help us understand the importance of instrument to patient tracking. So get ready to hear how scanning your department's instrumentation is critical to patient care and safety. So without further ado, let's welcome Tracy Raymond. Good morning and thank you. Um, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here um, on your early Friday morning. Um, let's go ahead and we can get started. So today, we're going to talk about the importance of tracking your instrumentation directly to the patient and back. Our objectives is we're going to look into what do the standards say? What is considered the best practice? What methods are there out there that we can use to track and, tra uh, to track and trace, whether it's manual or a computerized system? We're also going to discuss the benefits and, cha and, and challenges faced with each of those methods. So the standards, um, there are a few out there. Amy, of course, which is, you know, pretty much our Bible. It is expected that we have an accountability to our patients and our surgeons to be able to show that every instrument that passes through our department has received every step that the IFU states. Was it cleaned appropriately? Uh, was it inspected correctly? Packaged correctly and sterilized? So that way, if there is an infection or an issue, we can prove via our record keeping that that instrument set has been processed correctly. Joint Commission also looks at that um, they have um, their PCI 7.1. You have to have a method that shows that you're tracking reusable devices. In addition, right now, there's also the, G the GSI, which has a unique device identifier. And basically, it's, it states we have a responsibility to trace the reprocessing history of every instrument or scope. They, sh they need to be traced and tracked directly to the patients. So what is considered best practice? Best practice is a computerized instrument tracking system. And it, 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 it is costly upfront and you do have some um, like on, ongoing costs. However, it's the easiest for your team it's the easiest for when you have to dive back into the, the process to be able to prove that every step was done correctly. It's, it can also be paperless, which is really helpful. You don't have to pay for record keeping and all that kind of thing. Um, what's really nice too is if you choose, you can have it fully integrated so that it communicates directly with your EMR, your, your scheduling system, your sterilizers and your washers to be able to have a complete traceability that is easier to manage, easier to pull reports when needed. There are several systems out, out on the market. I have personally worked with three of them they all have their own pros and cons. So when you're doing research on what system is going to work best for you, you need to do your research. You need to fully look at what the systems offer. Talk to people that use those systems so that you can get an idea from 
actual users on what they think is best, what, you know, part of that, what potentially has been causing them issues, that type of thing. Because you need to find one that meets your needs the best. Get your whole team involved, your frontline users, because they sometimes are going to see things a little bit differently than the management will. Get their idea on it. Have the have your potential vendors come in so that your users can get a hands-on experience, let's say, to be able to, to see what potential issues or hiccups you may have. Um, so that way the whole team has a voice in saying what's going to work best for your de department. What's the benefits of having a computerized tracking sys system? One thing that I like is the fact that you can actually put pictures of your, of your instruments, pictures of your sets, because the OR our customers really like to be able to know that their sets basically are set up the same way each and every time, especially for those emergent type cases. It allows stand standardization. It allows proper training if you have new newer techs because the pictures are there. Um, so not only do you have the product numbers, but you have a picture that those new techs can look at to verify what the instrument looks like. You can attach the IFUs to your instruments and sets. What this does is it really allows adherence to all of those. There are so many out there and there's no way that we all are gonna be able to remember what every individual instrument I IFU states. What this also allows you to do is, as a manager, you can actually put alerts. So that way when that set or, or instrument is scanned, an alert will come up to be able to allow you to say, now this instrument is known to have bi bio burden stuck in this one spot. So you can have a picture of it. You can have a, a video that allows you to show how an instrument comes apart for proper cleaning, that, that type of thing. You want to scan it at every step of the process because it proves that you're following the IFU. It proves that it's going through the proper cleaning and it proves that it's going through the proper ster sterilize, sterilization. Sorry about that. It allows you to show a surveyor every step of the process. It allows you to pull a report in case there's an infection to prove that that instrument went through every step of the process. One thing that I find is also very, very helpful is location scanning. When you scan it at each step of the process, including when you put it away for storage or when you scan it to a case cart, when you need to find some something quickly, you can easily pull up the last spot it was scanned. It basically helps narrow down where you need to, to go to look for it. For example, I had an issue yesterday where I needed to find a set. I was able to pull that set up, find out where it was last scanned. So that way I knew the last spot it was at so that I didn't have to search every single area. Paperless. I've been in the field for over 25 years. So when I first started, I, um, of course it was all on paper. So when you had to find something, you had to literally go through every single piece of record keeping. That's very time consuming. Most of us don't have time to be looking through paper records. So being paperless and stored in the cloud, it's really easy to pull those reports and find what you need. The cons. There's some costs that are associated with it. So you really need to kind of do your pros, your benefits of having it, 
you know, what is your um, cost savings in the end? So you need to kind of look at that because you have your initial upfront costs. You have your system itself. You have the licensing. Computers, if you don't have computers. Handheld scanners are really nice for when you need to pull case cards or uh, scan your sets to their home. Um, label printers, um, that that type of thing. And then, of course, if you want to have it to where it can communicate with your EMR, your sterilizers, and your washers, <clears throat> you, there's an extra cost to that. Once you get your initial setup, then there is a monthly or yearly cost there thereafter, which basically helps provide um, any like updates for the computers, um, advances with the system, all those type of things. And typically your, your, your vendor will reach out and kind of ask and talk about what would you like in the future for that system to, to do. The one thing that I have found is as as well is you have a training of a multi generational workforce. the The younger team have no issues with the computer; they've grown up with it; they're used to it. However, your older team mem members may not be as easily um, user-friendly with a computer. So there's a little bit of training in that as, as well. So a computerized tracking system. What is nice is when it's integrated with your EMR, the schedule flows over to your, sis, your system. It allows you to see your needs. Um, it gives you a priority list so that way you know what trays need to be done. For example, when you scan a tray, it'll tell you if it's allocated for a uh, case in the future, whether it be that day or tomorrow. It's very easily then as well to scan trays to that case cart and uh, attach those instruments and sets directly to the patient. If you do not have any integration, you can create the case with a patient I, I, ID. So you can use their medical record number or whatever you choose to be able to attach that instrument to that patient. One of the things that you have to do, if, if you don't scan the case cart in DECON to show that it's those sets have come back, you have to then remember to empty the case cart because if you don't, and I found this out the hard way, if you don't remember to empty the case cart, the, the instrument list on that case cart just keeps growing and growing and growing. It makes it more difficult than to, when you need to track instruments to the patient and back because that case cart has so many different items on it that weren't used on that one patient. So that's just one of the things that you need to remember if you don't scan that case cart in DECON, you have to remember to, em to empty that case cart. There's different methods as well. Not every facility, especially if they're a smaller ASC, can, can afford or want to pay for a tracking system. So you can use manual methods. Um, there's things that you can use like an instrument tracking card. You put the tray names and number on that card with your sterilization info, the date it was sterilized, the sterilizer number, the load number. And then you can put that record on, or, or you can put that card in the patient's rec record. The difficulty with this is it's hard to then also prove that did it go through the decon process correctly? Was it cleaned correctly? If the IFU or instructions for use state that it needs to go in the sonic, how do you prove it went in the sonic if you're not scanning at each point? So you, you, you need to also take into account that type of thing. 
um, I was at a facility before that they actually took the the tape that was on the sets for 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 wrapping that had your tray name. It had your um, sticker for the sterile sterilize sterilization, and they actually had a separate a separate sheet of paper where they took that tape off when they unwrapped it in the room and attached it to that. And then that paper went on to um, the patient's record as well. Again, you also need to know how you would prove that it went through the proper processing and decon and assembly. Challenges. What happens if the team doesn't scan the sets appropriately. If something gets missed, they forgot to scan, then, you know, those, the processes, uh, it, it doesn't show that it went through each step of the process. What I have found that kind of helps with that is if you have um, a, stand, a standardized op operating process or instructions, and you train your team to that, and you make the right thing to, to do, the easiest thing to do, then perhaps the chances of a miss scan goes down. What happens if your internet goes down? You need to have a backup plan. You need to have, unfortunately, some sort of backup tray list because if you don't know by heart what all goes in a tray, and if those trays change over time, you need to update your backup tray list. There have been times where, unfortunately, the, the system goes down for what, whatever reason. Again, you need to have a backup plan. What happens if your barcodes don't scan? I actually had this yesterday where our label printers um, went out of alignment. So, you know, all, all of a sudden the barcodes weren't on the label correctly and they wouldn't scan. So you had to go through the process of getting that label printer basically back online and in correct working or order. Um, there are ways that you can, um, if, if you can't scan them, you can type in the number that is located underneath the barcode to allow tracking still to happen while you're working on a res resolution of that. What happens if the in integration between the EMR or the washers and sterilizers goes haywire, doesn't work right? You you at times may you you at times may have to kind of bounce back to a manual in a way where you would have to put in the system, you know, the, the sterilizer did its four minutes, you know, that, that type of thing. Challenges to manual, you need to have a record re retention. Um, you need to have a way to store them. So that way, if you have to go back, you can find that month or that day, you know, um, if in most places they do not have a spot where you can store these records. And depending on your state, it will determine how long you have to keep those records. So what happens if you have to retrieve a record for six months ago, let's say? That is a lot of um, longer work to be able to find the box as them. Do you have to call the record storage place and have a certain set of boxes sent back over? Then you have to look through all of those boxes to find the appropriate paperwork. What happens if paperwork gets lost? Unfortunately, it happens um, where all of a sudden you're missing a whole day's worth, let's say. What do you do in that case? So you, you kind of need to do a risk assessment and have a plan in place to be able to um, assist you if something like this happens. Challenges to all methods. Unfortunately, this happens. What happens if you've scanned or you've manually attached 
instrument sets to this patient. I've been in places where the OR all of a sudden will grab something off, right? And use it on a different patient. You need to have a plan of how this works. At a facility I was at, if this happened, my OR team had access to the system where they could then scan that set to the room. Then I knew the time and I could easily attach that set to that patient. You can train them a little bit further if, if able and be able to have them attach it to that case. So it allows you to be able to uh, handle that issue when a set is taken off. Um, or do they call you downstairs and say, hey, I took the minor tray off of my next case for this case. Can you make sure that it, it, it gets ad attached? I've also had it where a room has had very similar cases and they grabbed the wrong case cart for a different patient. So in that case, who handles the readjustment, right? Um, what if you are having a manual? So who then will change the information on that sheet to go in that record? So there's many challenges that you kind of have to look through to figure out how do I handle A, B, and C? And when you do a risk assessment on this type of stuff, have many people in the room because everybody's going to think of something that you might not think of. Okay. What about if you have to IUSS, or in my case, we use the one tray. How do you attach instruments or sets to that patient? Amy then does have a statement that you, when, when you use IUSS, you have to still attach that instrument to the patient. Some way you, you can either do it a manual where you use a patient sicker on the um, on either a record log or on a tray record sheet type of thing, which will then be in that patient's record and in your records. In a computerized system, um, you, it depends. Does your OR do their own uh, IUSS? Does sterile processing do it? So you have to figure out based on who does it, how that information gets into the computer. For example, where I am at, sterile processing does all of the IUSS or one tray. So we are able to input that information into the system. It, it directly attaches that IUSS or one tray event to the patient and has the instrument and or sets attached to the patient. It allows the, the people that know the most about sterilization uh, do the process to ensure that everything is captured. You have to decide what's best for your faci facility. Um, and basically, again, it needs to be a group of event. You need to have the discussion with the OR team, what makes more sense for your facility. What's coming up in the future, right? Um, you have unique device identifiers. So this process right now is currently being used for implants. Um, I was I attended a session um, probably at like six months ago where they were actually talking about getting the unique device identifiers on instruments, on loaners, you know, all that type of stuff. Speaking of loaners, how do you track the loaners? Um, at one of my facilities, facilities that I am over, we get approximately 50 to 100 loaners per day, depending on the case for the next day. 
how do you then track those loaner trays to the patient? If you just put in your system loaners or let's say Zimmer loaner or Smith and Nephew loaner, but you don't have an identifier for each loaner, how do you then track that to the patient? There's many different methods out there that you can do. Some of your computerized tracking systems have loaner modules, which will then allow you to be able to track um, individual loaner trays to the patients. There's also other systems out there that you can purchase um, tray tracking, case tracking, all that kind of stuff that you could use to be able to integrate with your system and then therefore track individual loaner trays. What happens if you have a manual system? You need to figure out how do I track individual loaner trays to the patient. Sometimes your uh, vendors may have um, an identifier on that tray. You could use that. Um, I strongly suggest taking pictures of the, your loaner trays as they come in as well. Not only does this help for traceability and tracking, but it also helps if you have any issues with lost instruments, broken instruments, or anything like that. It gives you a, a starting point. Um, so find a method that works best for your facility. The importance is to track every instrument and set to the patient if you have an infection in the future, you may be called upon to give a report on was everything processed appropriately. There's also, uh, um, they're talking about, you may have to have instrument specific in the, in the future. There's chemical etching, info dots, many different ways out there that you could track individual instruments to the patient as well. Um, the GSI or the GS1 global traceability standards. It's a tracking technology that would allow for complete traceability for every in instrument. Basically the way it is right now for pre-sterilized Im implants, you have a serial number for each, I each individual implant. You have um, the lot numbers. So you have everything together. The question is, is how is this then going to transfer over in the future, potentially on individual instruments? Or let's say implants that you have in your small frag sets or something like that, where they're not pre-sterilized. The question then is, is how do we then track those implants to the patient because we don't have the lot number or the serial number once we take it out of the package and put it in the set. How are then are we going to track those implants to that patient? This is a discussion that you need to have with your infection control professionals, with the OR team, with quality compliance to figure out a method that you could potentially use in the future to be able to do this. Currently right now, we are in discussions at the facility that I'm at to be able to find a way to track those implants that are in sets out, out of a package to the patients because God forbid what happens if we get a recall, recall notice from the vendor, how do we know what implant that that recall has was placed in a patient when you don't have the lot number and the serial number attached. So there's many different things that we need to think about mo moving for forward. So in May 2021, the FDA established this unique identification system, which will link surgical instruments directly to that patient. 
we need to make sure that we have a way to track all instrument sets, trays to the patient. Um, whatever method you have right now is, is a good start. We just need to find a way to move forward to be able to give our patients and customers what they need and deserve. Every one of us could, could be a patient. We, may, we, sh we have the right to know where our sets, where our instruments, where our implants all process correctly. What happens when there's an infection? We know it happens. We also know that it's not always instrument related, it's a patient related issue. For example, last week, um, I was informed of an, an infection in an orth, ortho patient. So I luckily have a computerized tracking system. So I was able to pull the report for the trays and sets and instruments that was used on that patient to be able to show it went through every single point of the process that it should. What happens though, if for whatever reason, a scan was missed, that type of thing, how do you handle that? Um, I think what you need to do at that point is you tell your infection control, here's the report. However, the scan was missed, let's say on the Sonic you could then say to that infection control person or quality person, you know, um, the process was followed. However, the scan was missed. And then you go back to the person that was in de decon that day and you have a, a conversation, a training, um, you know, you kind of talk about now, unfortunately this was two months ago when this trade went through, right? They're not going to remember. Sometimes we have t a hard time re remembering what might have happened yesterday, right? So you just talk about it. You retrain if needed. You, you also use that as a learning and opportunity for improvement. I like to look at those type of things as an opportunity for improvement because if you focus all on the discipline or the negative portion of it, most likely your team is not going to be as receptive to extra learning, extra training, you know, that type of stuff. Um, you need to then use that to train the whole team to say, we had an issue, this got missed. How do we make sure it doesn't happen again? Let's follow the process. Is there an issue in the process that the team may be able to bring forward that you may not be aware of because you're not in the front line every single day? They have many observations that will help you improve your tracking processes. Um, they may have ideas that you might not have thought of to improve the system. Talk to your OR. They might have ideas to improve the system in terms of the uh, case tracking um, to the patient and back. There's many different ideas out there that one person is not gonna know all the right things, okay? Um, compliance. We have to find a way that we can comply with these guidelines, uh, with the recommended practices. We need to protect ourselves. We need to protect our facilities. We do not want to be in the headlines. We do not want to have an infection that goes to court for some reason. If you are not have a way that shows you're in compliance, Basically, your facility is going to just be able just have to write the check. Um, we have to have traceability. We owe it to our customers. We owe it to our patients to provide them with superior care. 
Superior care is doing what's right each and every single time. It allows our clinical personnel to be able to promise their patients, whether it's your surgeons or your nurses, to promise them that they're gonna get the best care possible. And by doing that, by saying that, we as sterile processing technicians owe it to our customers, our surgeons, our OR team members, our patients, that every instrument is processed correctly. Every instrument is inspected correctly, tested correctly. Um, so that way they, we know, they know that they're gonna get the best care. Some final thoughts. If you don't have a computerized tracking system, you may want to look into getting one. The benefits, in my opinion, far outweigh the cons. It is worth the cost in the end. Do, a, a, do an, an uh, analysis, do, you know, a cost savings. You know, yes, it's this much up front. You may save this month, this much in pr production time because it makes it easier for our technicians to put the sets together, um, to find sets. You're not spending too much time trying to locate a set because it allows you to pull up where it was last scanned. Um, it also provides savings in the end when you have to have records, when you have to walk through all of these boxes of records to find what you need. So all that stuff, all that cost, all that production lost will help in the end, or God forbid, if you get called into court and you don't have everything in line, it's very costly in the end. Those of you that have a computerized system, if you don't have it where it's integrated with your scheduling system, your washers, your sterilizers, you may want to look into getting it. I have found it is a huge cost saver. It allows us not only to, you know, um, save time in inputting the in information because it flows over from your washers and your sterilizers. It proves that those cycles ran effectively. Um, the other thing is your, you have an increased compliance with your, uh, your IFUs, your standard operating procedures, your guidelines, because everything is in there at the tips of your technicians. If they have a question, all they gotta do is hit the little med media link it shows, it can then pull up the IFU, it can pull up a video, it can pull up what that instrument looks like, how it comes apart, how it goes together. It, you can have, have it shown on there how you test it, that type of thing. When you have it in, integrated to your scheduling system, when you're really busy, and a lot of us are short staffed right now, it allows you to focus on the instruments and trays that are pri priority. You know what you need to focus on either for turnovers for that day or things you need to have sterilized for tomorrow. It really gives you more of a focused approach on what you need to get done that day. All of us would love to be able to say, we have zero down in, in the morning, meaning there are no trays left to be done. In reality, we know and understand that that is not always possible. It is a great goal. And a lot of, you know, I'm happy to say that about 75% of the time will we reach that goal. But on those other days, you need to have a focused up approach. By also having that integration, you have an, incre an, an, an increased knowledge of what your inventory is. How many do you have? You don't have to th remember, okay, I have 10 minor trays and I have this and I have that. If you need to find one instrument and you don't have a separate peel pack, you can figure out what tray you could give 
that room for that one thing that, that they need. It also allows you to have a location. You know the last time it was scanned. It allows you as well to be able to say how my trays are being used. Is there something that isn't being used or hasn't been used in the last two years? Maybe it's time to decrease your inventory to dismantle that tray and maybe create a different tray that would get used more or have different peel packs, you know, that type of thing. It allows you to be able to know your usage rates. If you use a, a hand tray and, you know, it's getting turned repeatedly throughout the day because you have so many cases and you don't have enough inventory, it allows you to have proof to say, I need to purchase more. M many different things instead of just going off of what someone says because you have a manual system, when you have the numbers, the black and white numbers, it really helps to prove to finance or whoever allows dollars to be spent what you need to make things work better for our customers and our patients. And then my last slide is my, re my references. Um, and you can reach out to me if you have any further questions on, on those type of things. And I would love to be able to answer any questions at this point. And I thank you for joining us. Awesome. Tracy, thank you so, so much for sharing your insights today. Uh, we had, we have a very engaged group joining us this morning. <laughs> so we've had quite a few questions come through and I'd love to get as many in as we can. Um, the first one uh, says, what are your thoughts on working with the OR team to ensure scanning happens during case cart switching and additions to the room from the sterile core? Yeah. So um, I, I've had both good and bad <laughs> experiences with this. Um, when um, when I first started to talk with the with the OR at a larger facility that that I was at, you know, I I received a a, a, a lot of pushback because we're too busy, right? We don't have time for that, you know, that type of thing. What I did is um, I had trained training sessions, we actually had the nurses and the techs were able to log into the system. They could, and I taught them that they could choose that patient easily. It didn't take, I, it didn't take that long. You know, it's basically having to prove to them that it, it's not that much of a time kill mm -hmm. to be able to. So after they would get in the room, after, you know, the case got going and the nurses had a few more minutes because they're charting and that type of stuff. They, I taught them that they could go in the system and they could scan this, the added trays or that type of thing to the sets. I also, um, what helped us is they could call the manager, they could call the lead tech and we would come up and help them if they were having any issues with it. Where I'm at right now, I have a very engaged o o OR team. They love to be able to uh, assist us, which is great. It's a really good team at, at atmosphere. And um, they jumped right on this. They, they've gotten involved. They enjoy it. Um, it. It's different for every one of us. The basics is to to be there for them, to show them it doesn't take that long, to show them the benefits in the end, how much it benefits them, how much it benefits the patient. Absolutely. It's one of those process changes where any change is going to be kind of an uphill battle, but once you kind of get used yeah. to the change, and I love how you make it sort of a group effort in learning something new and learning the impact of a change like that. Um, that's incredible. Yes. Uh, the next question, what is your best advice to convince higher level administration to incorporate this technology in sterile processing? Are there cost bracket breakdowns? What advice do you have? So it, it is a struggle, especially because 
sterile processing is a non-revenue department, right? However, what I had found is uh, data works. I I am a spreadsheet (laughs) junkie. I love Excel (laughs) spreadsheets. So I basically broke it down to say, this is how much the techs make. This is how much time it takes to locate a set or to put a set together or that type of thing um, to be able to break it down. Um, Mm -hmm. The other thing is that I used is how much an SSI cost, how much would that facility have to potentially pay out or not get reimbursed from insurances because a patient had an SSI related to the instruments maybe not getting processed correctly Hmm. or IUSS rates being too high and joint commission or whoever comes in and does your surveys and they ding you. Try to bring that back because when they see that they're not going to get reimbursed or that they're going to get dinged on a survey, they're going to be more Mm -hmm. receptive in the potential out costs, right? Mm -hmm. And you could potentially start with a system that's maybe more simpler where you don't have all the add-ons, let's say, to get the process going. Because once the process gets going, you could then say, look, we're this much more efficient now. Can we get this added to it? And maybe Mm -hmm. it's the integration with the scheduling system at first Mm -hmm. to be able to show how much it helps. Follow-up question. What do you think is most effective out of the three things that you listed, stating sort of uh, staffing costs for inefficiencies Mm -hmm. uh, to administrators, stating potential um, non-reimbursements or stating sort of a, this, this idea of a potential cost of an SSI? So in my experience, uh, at least based on who I've worked with in the C-suite, it is the potential of an SSI and the non-reimbursement. Mm-hmm. Also, if you're having pushback, get a surgeon on your side because they also do not want any of their patients to get an an SSI. So if you have a surgeon backing you, it really assists you in getting the win from the the C-suite to be able to get something. Okay, great, great. Um, another good question. What questions have you gotten in the past from Joint Commission or the Department of Health officials related to tracking system records? Are they looking at those things or is it more of like a legal protection in case something big happens? So my experience, I've done surveys with both manual and a tracking system. I have had surveyors throw out a date to me and say, can you pull the records for this date? And they want to see the records for sterilization. It's a lot more difficult when you have to go and find the paper records. Mm -hmm. When I had it with the paper records, it was like, okay, I got a call. I got to get that box of records and you have to get it before they leave for the survey. Right? when I got the same question, when I had a computerized tracking, I was like, oh, great, here, da, 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 da. and I was able to pull it up really fast. What helped in that point was they basically stopped a- asking questions about our records, They because they saw right then and there we had it. Hmm. When it was more of a manual, they kept digging further because not only then did they want to see the sterilization record, well, then they wanted to have proof of how did it go through the washer? You know, how do you know your washer oh, worked effectively? So it allowed basically, uh, I don't want to say a shutdown of the surveyor questions, but it pretty much showed to them, oh, they got their stuff. I don't need to dig any further. 
Okay. Do you see that as a good thing or a bad thing? Like in, in terms of patient safety and in terms of what they're supposed to, the role that they're supposed to be playing, what are your thoughts? That's such an interesting bit of feedback. So in the heat of the moment, it's really a nice thing as a manager because you're like, yeah, (laughs) but if you're a patient, you would want your surveyor to dig a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of one of those good and bad things at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, I always like to approach it as if we're doing the right thing every single time, they can dig as much as they want because I have it there. Mm -hmm. In a manual system, though, it's a little bit harder to, to prove the point. So it, yeah, you're right. It is one of those good and bad things because you want them to dig further because it's their job. Mm-hmm. But on the other end, you're like, yay, I'm good. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Type of> thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Yep. Makes perfect sense. <laughs> Anxiety producing for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, oh, goodness. Um, okay. Another question came through. Actually, this is just a quick one. Um, this attendee said, I found much of this info invaluable and would love to be able to rewatch and receive slides from this session. Yes, that is possible. Anyone who wants to rewatch this, feel free to do so. Share it with your colleagues, share it with your team, um, share it with the leaders of your department. The slides are available for download in the resources tool on the right-hand side of your page. So thank you for tuning and in. I'll and I'll just jump and onto that, that. And, say, mm-hmm. and say, if you have any further questions or follow-up questions, you can always reach out to me as, as, as well. Great. Um, next question. This is an interesting one for it's future focused. Is there any technology yeah. that you know of using visual camera identification of instruments? So at my previous facility, we were working on that with a vendor um, to have a visual tracking of every in, in instrument. Um, I could definitely see in in the future where something like this may come come forth. Um, I don't know how far in the future. I found (laughs) it very interesting and exciting as I played with it um, because I kind of like to play with these new things that come out. Um, I just don't know how far ahead it may be. But yes, there was a specific vendor. I have some good news for whoever asked that question and for you. Um, Give it, let's call it a week and a half. uh, And tune in to Beyond Clean SPX 2022. Uh, We have a virtual vendor expo coming up. Our sponsor for today, Census, is part of it as well. And if you haven't registered, definitely do so at educate.beyondclean.net slash SPX 2022. Uh, Guarantee, if this question piqued your interest, you're going to want to tune in to the the sterile processing industry's only social media vendor expo. So quick little plug for that. Um, Awesome. I'm excited. Good. (laughs) Good. This next question says, what training programs have you implemented in your department to ensure the understanding of processes related to tracking? And do you bring vendors in to that? The question, the answer to that is yes to both. So I have promised my team a monthly training session. So we do many different things. I have vendors come in. We we do initial training, ongoing training. Um, and I basically, what I choose to train on maybe issues that have come up o- o- over the last month, whether it be an instrument that's not getting cleaned correctly or a struggling set, you know, those type of things. So we will retrain, we will do hands-on. I bring vendors in, um, that way it allows my team to get one CEU per month. Um, And so we basically encompass the whole thing. And, I start in decon, work my way through, right? So there's many different ways that you can do it. Use your vendors because they uh, they are very helpful. They know their instruments or they know their system and they can come in and really assist your team in becoming the best that they can be. Awesome. 
I love that. And I think that that is actually the perfect note to end on. Uh, Tracy, thank you so much for getting the biggest global instrument tracking conference off the ground this morning. We're honored to have you as part of the speaker lineup today. You did a fantastic job sharing your insights. You. Uh, based on the comments that are coming through, a lot of people are going to be sharing this presentation with their with their colleagues. And so we're, we're super excited about that. For those of you wondering what that link was that I mentioned about the virtual vendor expo, register at educate.beyondclean.net slash SPX. 2022. All right, everyone. It has been a fantastic morning so far. Thank you for your incredible engagement this early in the morning. We had great questions come in. If we didn't get to yours, which there are quite a few we didn't get to, but we will make sure Tracy receives your questions and we'll email you directly. You can connect with her via email or LinkedIn. Her contact information is on the screen in the bio tool on the right-hand side of your screen. After the session, your screen will automatically transition you to the next one. But as a reminder, there is a 15 minute break between each session throughout today's conference. If the registration page appears and you've already registered, you can click the already registered link and enter your email address to enter the event. Uh, you'll be able to access the CE survey and certificate at the end of today's sessions. And just a reminder, you'll see the bonus content found in the resources window on the right hand side of your screen. All of these sessions today will be available on demand. So you can share them, you can watch them again, um, use them as resources. That's what we love about these events is that they live on um, outside of the live event. So that's wonderful. We're so glad you're all here and we will see you again in about 15 minutes. Thanks again, Tracy. Thank you. Bye-bye.